Hello, my name is Tim Pipe. And I'm Shri Fred Omojoli. And welcome to this Dentin's webinar on the legal issues in structuring oil and gas financings in Nigeria. I'm a partner and Shri is an associate in the Structured Commodities and Natural Resources Finance team here at Dentin's in London. This webinar will last for about 30 minutes and in it we'll be exploring the following topic areas. First, we'll look briefly at the recent history of financings in the Nigerian EMP sector. We'll then explore the potential sources of debt finance available to Nigerian EMP companies before taking a more detailed look at some of the key legal and regulatory considerations for funders. And finally, we will discuss potential solutions to the challenges and obstacles which funders may face when structuring financings for Nigerian EMP companies. In this webinar, we're going to use a number of industry acronyms which you may or may not be familiar with. For your reference, the next slide sets out these acronyms and their meanings. So now let's go straight to the first of these topic areas, the recent history of Nigerian ENP financings. In the period from 2010 to 2015, there was a major expansion in bank finance for the development of the ENP sector in Nigeria. In the same period, a number of the international oil companies operating in Nigeria, Shell, Chevron, Total, Eni and ConocoPhillips sold to Nigerian companies something in excess of $9 billion worth of petroleum assets, much of which was funded by way of international and domestic bank finance. So why this flurry of divestments? There were at least four relevant factors. Firstly, 2010 saw the passing of the Nigerian Oil and Gas Industry Content Development Act, this legislation, commonly known as the Local Content Act, was enacted to enhance the level of participation in Nigeria's oil and gas industry by Nigerians and Nigerian companies. In the spirit of the Local Content Act, IOCs were encouraged to ensure that bidders for their stakes in the oil mining leases on the blocks for sale were Nigerians or companies owned by Nigerians. In 2012, the Nigerian government further favoured Nigerian EMP companies with a selective granting of pioneer status. A company with pioneer status has the benefit of tax holidays, exemptions from withholding tax, the ability to carry forward losses and other fiscal incentives. Secondly, in the years from 2000 to 2010, there was a substantial consolidation of the banking sector in Nigeria. In this period, the number of banks shrank from more than 89 in 2000 to only 24 by 2010. This process was largely driven by the Central Bank of Nigeria introducing more demanding capital requirements. The consolidation, together with the effects of the global carry trade on Nigeria, resulted in large inflows of investment to the surviving Nigerian banks and this led to the banks having large amounts of cash available to lend. Thirdly, many years of sabotage and theft in the Niger Delta incentivized the IOCs to sell their onshore and shallow water assets. For many years, crude oil from the Niger Delta has been siphoned from pipelines on an industrial scale. In 2013, it was estimated that 200,000 barrels a day representing 10% of Nigeria's production was being siphoned off pipelines across the region. The loss of this production has had a detrimental effect on IOC's revenues in Nigeria. Aside from the economic impact, there has been an environmental cost too. In many parts of the Niger Delta where pipelines run, large quantities of spilled crude oil have polluted the environment and enormous fires fill the air with toxic smoke. Given the IOC's international commitment to environmental protection, 
Ownership of these onshore and near onshore assets has led to bad publicity and large claims from those affected. Finally, the oil price during the period from 2010 to 2014 was relatively stable and consistently hovered above $90 for much of the period, resulting in generous valuations for the sale assets. So the alignment of these four factors created conditions perfect for a major debt-funded program of divestments by the IOCs to Nigerian ENP companies. You can see in the next slide some examples of the divestments which took place during this period. So moving on now to the types of debt capital available to ENP companies in Nigeria. These can be summarized as follows. Commercial bank debt in the form of loans from international or domestic banks. Finance from international financial institutions or IFIs. High yield bonds listed on an international stock exchange. And finance provided by oil off takers such as the IOCs and commodity traders. A number of the IOC divestments and the development of petroleum assets have been financed with large loans. The majority of these loans have been provided by Nigerian banks, although international banks operating in Nigeria have also particip participated in this funding program. They are typically structured as reserve-based loans, meaning that the loan size is linked to the estimated value of the reserves over the lifetime of the facility. These RBL loans usually charge interest at a floating rate and are secured over assets, shares, and bank accounts. We will discuss the types of security available to creditors later in this webinar. Because an RBL loan is generally provided by a relatively small syndicate of banks, a borrower can benefit from the relationships which it develops with the syndicate, meaning that if it experiences problems complying with the terms of its financing, it may be able to get temporary relief from acceleration in enforcement. However, because RBL loans are sized off the value and volume of reserves, they are sensitive to fluctuations in commodity price and asset performance. As we've seen over the past couple of years, redeterminations of the value and volume of reserves can lead to huge drops in the amount of the permitted debt. These have seen borrowers face impossible demands for prepayment by lenders. EMP companies have also raised finance from a number of IFIs. These include the International Finance Corporation, which is a part of the World Bank, the Africa Finance Corporation, and the Africa Export Import Bank. These IFIs lend on a bilateral basis as well as taking participations in syndicated loan facilities alongside commercial banks. IFI's participation in upstream financing in Nigeria is generally regarded as positive by commercial banks as IFIs conduct deep due diligence and impose high levels of scrutiny and environmental compliance requirements on the borrowers. Some Nigerian ENP companies have diversified their sources of funding to include high yield bonds. Bonds can provide a useful hedge against the risks associated with RBR loans because they are usually non-amortizing, they carry a fixed rate of interest and they do not fluctuate based on the value and volume of reserves. However, there are some disadvantages. Bonds must be drawn in full on day one, so interest accrues on the full amount of the bond, whether or not the funds have been applied against the borrower's capex or opex requirements. Borrowers cannot be certain of the identity of their bondholders at any given time, and so bonds and bondholders can be inflexible when it comes to negotiating waivers for defaults. In addition, the relationship between RBL lenders on the one hand and bondholders on the other 
can be difficult to navigate. And there's also a refinancing risk if at the point at which a bond is maturing, the high yield bond market is closed for refinancings, as it currently is for most EMP companies. Finally, we've seen Nigerian EMP companies finance acquisitions and developments using finance provided by the IOCs and certain oil traders. In a number of the IOC divestments, the IOC has agreed to provide debt finance to the purchaser in order to complete the sale. This financing may be all of the debt required to complete the divestment or the debt may be provided alongside commercial debt or an IFI loan. Although this form of finance may be essential in order to complete a divestment, it can be challenging for the borrower to borrow from a potential commercial competitor in the upstream business. In particular, measures need to be put in place to restrict the flow of confidential corporate information which borrowers are usually required to provide to their lenders. With the recent decline in local and international bank funding to the Nigerian EMP sector, certain oil traders have filled the void to some extent. In order to gain exclusive rights to petroleum production, we've seen traders offering prepayment facilities to upstream producers. In other words, making a substantial upfront payment in exchange for guaranteed future deliveries of petroleum products, as well as joining commercial banks as lenders in RBL facilities. As with vendor financing being provided by an IOC, having an oil trader which has the dual role of lender and off-taker makes it important for borrowers and other lenders to consider whether there should be limitations on the flow of confidential commercial information. We're now going to move on to discuss some of the features of the Nigerian legal and regulatory regimes which are relevant to funders to ENP companies. There are five distinct legal systems in Nigeria. English law, which dates back to Nigeria's history as a British colony. Statutory law, which is passed by Nigeria's lawmakers since independence in 1960. Common law, developed by Nigeria's judiciary since independence. Customary law, which applies in different parts of the country in accordance with local custom. And finally, Sharia law, which is applied in certain northern states of Nigeria. For the purpose of this webinar, we'll only be focusing on English law, statute and common law. For funders looking to provide debt to a Nigerian EMP company, it's important to understand the regulatory framework for ownership of production assets. For the purpose of this webinar, we are going to focus on the oil mining leases, also known as OMLs, which have been issued by the Nigerian government to exploit territorial rights for oil. The IOCs, which have divested their onshore and nearshore assets to Nigerian EMP companies, have sold their rights in the OMLs, along with their rights in the underlying agreements, such as the Joint Operating Agreement, Associated Crude Handling, or Marketing Agreements. An OML is a concession granted jointly to one or more commercial adventurers and the government representative, which is the Nigerian Petroleum Development Company. This concession is granted in order to exploit petroleum assets located in a defined geographical area for a fixed period of time. NPDC is usually granted a majority participating interest in each OML, typically around 55%, while the commercial ventures share between them a minority participating interest. No transfer of rights and obligations under an OML can be made without the consent of the Minister for Petroleum Resources. This rule applies whether the transfer is an ovation of the OML from one party to another or if the transfer is carried out indirectly 
by a transfer of the shares of the OML company. When deciding whether to approve an OML transfer, the Minister of Petroleum Resources must be satisfied that the proposed transferee has the financial and technical abilities to properly exploit the asset. It is important for the funders and bidders to factor into the acquisition timetable the length of time it may take to obtain ministerial consent. By way of example, in 2014, when Orlando requested ministerial consent for its acquisition of some of ConocoPhillips' onshore assets, the consent process delayed the transaction timeline by close to 12 months. In addition to restricting their ability to dispose of their participating interests, the terms of most OMLs restrict commercial venturers' rights to create security over their participating interests. In a typical RBL facility, the lenders would normally seek a security assignment of the borrower's participating interests. However, the terms of the standard OML make no distinction between an outright assignment and an assignment by way of security. As a consequence, Nigerian Council's advice generally is that no security assignment of a venturer's rights under an OML may be given without ministerial consent. Since consent is not typically granted, lenders have come to understand and accept that a security assignment cannot be given. That's not to say, however, that a security interest cannot be granted over a borrower's participating interest in an OML. In a number of financing, the borrower has granted a fixed charge. Since charges are not explicitly prohibited by the standard OML, Nigerian Council's advice in those transactions has been that ministerial approval is not required at the time the security interest is granted. However, it's clear that on an enforcement of a fixed charge, no transfer of an OML interest to a third party can take place without the minister's prior approval. We are now going to look at the structures by which Nigerian EMP companies have acquired their participating interest in oil mining leases. There are three general methods by which a participating interest can be acquired. These include, first, it may be issued directly by the NNPC. Secondly, it may be acquired from an existing participation holder. And finally, a purchaser may acquire the shares of a company which is a participation holder. In most cases, Nigerian EMP companies have acquired participations in their OMLs directly. That is to say that they have been issued by NNPC or there's been an ovation of an OML from an existing holder to that Nigerian EMP company. However, there are some examples of financings where the interest has been acquired indirectly via the purchase of shares of a company which is a participation holder. There are or were a couple of reasons for structuring an acquisition in this way. Firstly, prior to the judgment of the Nigerian High Court in a case known as Moni Pulo and Brass in 2012, purchasers were advised that ministerial approval for the purchase of shares in a company which held a participating interest was not required. And so given the expense and difficulty in obtaining ministerial consent, it was sometimes the case that participations in OMLs were acquired in this way. However, the High Court in Monipulo made it clear that ministerial approval for such acquisitions is required, thereby obviating one of the key reasons for structuring an acquisition as a share purchase as opposed to an asset purchase. A second reason for structuring an acquisition by way of a share purchase over a, an asset purchase might be to benefit from any tax losses which the interest holding company might carry. There are, however, certain drawbacks to structuring the acquisition of an OML participating interest indirectly through a share purchase. The key problem which is relevant where the acquisition is to be funded by debt is financial assistance. Under the Companies and Allied Matters Act, 
a Nigerian company is prohibited from providing financial assistance, either directly or indirectly, for the purpose of acquiring shares in that target company. Effectively, this rule prevents funders to a borrower looking to acquire the shares of a target company from taking security or guarantees from that target company. It also prohibits the target company from making a loan to the borrower to repay the acquisition debt. In Nigeria, there's no equivalent to the English law whitewash procedure and breach of the financial assistance rules will result in the relevant transaction being void and unenforceable. This is clearly suboptimal from a financing perspective, particularly if the borrower has no significant assets or sources of income other than the target company. However, there are a number of ways in which a financing might be structured which mitigate the problem of financial assistance. We will discuss two options in turn. The first option is a post-acquisition merger of the purchaser and the target company. Once the target company has been merged into the purchaser, it is possible for the merged entity to grant security over all of its assets, including the assets formerly owned by that target company. This option is attractive, but will require regulatory consent, which may or may not be forthcoming and may take a long period of time to be obtained. The second option is to effect a debt pushdown where the bank loans to the purchasers are substituted with bank loans to the target company. In order for this to work, the target company must have distributable reserves. In the next slide, you can see an example of how a debt pushdown might work in practice. Firstly, the lenders provide the purchaser with a loan to finance the acquisition of the target company. We'll call this the acquisition loan. Next, in a series of steps which take place post-acquisition, the target company borrows from the lenders an amount equal to its distributable reserves. We'll call this the reserves loan. The target company then applies the proceeds of the reserves loan to pay a dividend to the purchaser. The purchaser then uses that dividend payment to partially repay the acquisition loan. And finally, the target company is then able to grant security in favour of the lenders over its assets to secure its liabilities under the reserves loan. These steps can take place on the same day by way of book entries to avoid the lenders having a double exposure. We're now going to look at some issues relating to the payment of stamp duty and registration fees required in order to perfect security over EMP's company's assets in Nigeria. Nigerian law requires that a funder taking security over a Nigerian asset must ensure the following. Firstly, that the documentation evidencing the security interest is duly stamped by the Federal Internal Revenue Services Stamp Duty Office in order to ensure that such document is admissible in a Nigerian court. And secondly, that the security interest is registered at the Corporate Affairs Commission in order to ensure that the, fender, the funder's security interest is publicly available and valid against third parties. In order to complete these processes, stamp duty and a registration fee must be paid. In Nigeria, stamp duty and the registration fee are calculated on an ad valorem basis, meaning that the larger the debt, which is secured, the higher the stamp duty and registration fee. These costs will apply on an aggregate basis, regardless of the number of security documents being stamped and registered. At present, the rate of stamp duty payable is 0.375% of the secured amount, and the registration fee is 1%. 
In a billion dollar secured financing then, the combined stamp duty and registration fee would total $13,750,000. In response to these very high costs, a practice known as upstamping has been developed by funders on large financings. Upstamping means that instead of paying the full amount of stamp duty and registration fee following execution of the relevant security document, the funder agrees that the borrower is only required to pay the duty and fee in respect of a fraction, say 10% of the secured debt on day one, with an undertaking to pay the duty and fee in respect of the secured debt uh, in prescribed circumstances, such as the occurrence of an event of default. So on a billion dollar secured financing, this would reduce the amount of duty and fee paid on day one down to $1,375,000, while still enabling the security document to be stamped and registered with the Corporate Affairs Commission. The upstamping market practice is not without risk to funders. We're going to discuss four potential risks. Firstly, so long as only a fraction of the secured debt is stamped and registered, the funders can only enforce their security in the Nigeria's court up to that fraction. In other words, if only $100 million of a $1 billion debt has been stamped, the funders can only enforce their security to recover a maximum of $100 million. In respect of the remaining $900 million, they would rank pari passu with the borrowers other unsecured creditors. Secondly, if the borrower were to grant second ranking security over the same assets to a new funder, and the stamp duty and registration fee in respect of that new funder's debt were fully paid, that new funder would rank behind the existing funder in respect of the first 10% of value in the secured asset but would rank ahead of the existing funder in respect of any remaining value in the secured assets. Thirdly, if an event of default occurs and the borrower is required to pay the balance of the stamp duty and registration fees, there is a risk that the borrower may not have the cash at that point in time. And finally, if an event of default occurs and the borrower pays the unpaid stamp duty and registration fees. But there is an insolvency procedure at the borrower within three months of such payment being made. That payment may be held to be void as a preference under Nigerian corporate law. These risks can be mitigated to some extent. To ensure that the borrower has sufficient funds to pay the balance of the stamp duty and registration fee, the, the funders may require the borrower to deposit an amount equal to the unpaid duty and fee in a blocked upstamping reserve account. Understandably, borrowers object to having such a large amount of cash blocked, but in light of recent insolvencies and a consequent tightening of credit terms, funders have stronger leverage to demand this. To ensure that no second ranking security interest gains priority, the credit agreement should obviously include a rigorous negative pledge. And to ensure that payment of the balance of the stamp duty and registration fee is not characterised as a preference, the trigger for this payment must be sufficiently sensitive that it can be exercised well in advance of insolvency, although obviously this is easier said than done. It is clear that in developing the upstamping market practice, funders to EMP companies have had to assess and get comfortable with the reality that some of the risks associated with upstamping can be mitigated better than others, but none of these risks can be completely avoided. We're now going to look briefly at issues relating to onshore domiciliation of oil revenues, which will be of particular relevance to international lenders. In common with many other oil producing countries, 
the Central Bank of Nigeria requires that petroleum export revenues are repatriated to Nigerian bank accounts. In February 2015, the Central Bank of Nigeria updated its rules regarding such repatriation, specifying that 100% of export revenues from petroleum sales must be repatriated to a bank account in Nigeria within 90 days of shipment of the petroleum product. In addition, the Central Bank of Nigeria has imposed restrictions on the ability of EMP companies to immediately expatriate those revenues to an offshore account once they are paid onshore. Whereas, it had previously been possible for up to 90% of petroleum export revenues to be sent offshore immediately after such monies were paid onshore. Now, however, those revenues must remain within Nigeria unless the proposed offshoring constitutes an eligible transaction. The circular issued by the Central Bank of Nigeria in February 2015 defines eligible transaction to include a number of things. These relate to the payment of contractor invoices and debt service together with any other transaction that may be permitted by the Central Bank of Nigeria. These new rules issued by the Central Bank of Nigeria do not make it impossible to structure an international financing. However, international lenders expecting to control an EMP company's expenditure from an offshore bank account will no longer have this option. And so that brings us to the end of this webinar. Thank you for listening and we hope you found it useful and informative. Goodbye. Goodbye.